Okay, then we get to another subject. And that is mining electronic healthcare records, which we hear so much about. Um, I'm taking this as an example. This is an article in uh, Computer. That's IEEE, Computer Magazine. Mining electronic healthcare records. And they say, initial efforts to mine electronic healthcare records are unlikely to yield many eureka insights, but there are many opportunities for improving delivery efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare. And you've all seen these kinds of sentences, right? And if you're unlucky, you're actually going to write this kind of nonsense. Because it sounds good, this is the way to get project money. But it doesn't mean anything. If somebody can tell me what this means, I'd be very happy. No candidates? <laughs> okay, so if you look further in this, I take a quote. The lack of standardization in how medical information is encoded and stored is a major difficulty that's hindering automation. Okay. Fine. This we hear all the time too. If only the medical record was in the standard code, snow or whatever, we could automate it. Automate what? What exactly? This is a question I've asked many people. They all say, ah, you're just being difficult. <laughs> Can anyone tell me what you want to automate? Yeah? The knowledge. The knowledge. Yeah, okay. Can you specify? <laughs> what is that? Yeah? Searching. Searching. What's wrong with Control F? But you said you really didn't have control. So instead of that, we're going to introduce terminology. <laughs> I think a, a guy I know at the second largest company said Control F, okay. He implemented it in their system in 30 minutes. That was in APL. Control what? Control P, that's the next step. <laughs> Don't be difficult. You were going to ask something? No, so... so uh, now that's important because what you mean by automation? If you go on, this is a diagram they show in this article. Well, we found out from the record that this is what happens. When you do bone marrow biopsy, some went to the initial hospital care, genetic examination, BMT, and I think all of them died or something. Right? Okay, they get this great diagram, what happened to the patients in this record after all this effort. And I'm still asking, so what? Why do I want to know this? They don't answer that question. They just say, well, you know, it's self-evident. If you can extract this, this must be good. Quote marks. There's another diagram from there where the cluster, I actually must admit I gave up. I don't know what it's good for, but it's very impressive. Data mining might not detect the association between asthma exacerbation and smoking if asthma exacerbation is coded, but smoking is only described in clinical documents. Okay, is there anyone that needs a computer system to know that smoking is not good for asthma? <laughs> right? <laughs> you could say it's just a bad example. Yes, it's a bad example, but give me a good example then. Nobody can. I've asked. No, but you know, it's just an example. Yeah, but an example of what? This is the kind of nonsense you see. This is a... This is a uh, class A journal. I mean, this is peer-reviewed journal and everything, and the information technology behind it, it's all fantastic. But the thing is, it has no point. And that eludes them completely. They still do their studies. One of the three authors is a professor in pediatrics, which only goes to show, don't trust doctors. Right? right? Um, so, which leads me immediately to what can we not do with computers in medicine. And this is extremely important. This is the research of the electronic healthcare record fallacy. Because you see it as a sales argument for a lot of these systems. It says, yes, but once you have standard, standard terminology and you have it all in the computer, now you can start doing research on it. Now you can find out how many patients of that kind got this. Right? How many patients uh, that were treated in, with method A uh, survived compared to patients treated with method B? You've seen them all probably. Yeah? That sounds pretty good, but it's totally crazy. Yes, we can do it. That doesn't mean we should do it. And the reason is this. Anecdotal versus evidence-based. 
It's a very important difference. Anecdotal medicine is what we had until about 15 or 20 years ago. And anecdotal is exactly that, it's telling each other fairy tales. The characteristics of anecdotal is that you examine histories of patients post hoc, after the fact. You go into records and you sort them out and say these patients were treated this way, these patients were treated that way, and this is what I also did in the 80s. Which means it's retrospective, it's after the fact. It's not blinded. Both the patient and the doctor knew which treatment they got. It's not randomized. It's no control group, which means that in many of these cases, patients had diseases because of the place they lived, because of the environment, the food they ate, the, the uh, poisons in the atmosphere, all this stuff that we don't know. So you could have a group living in this very toxic village, getting medicine A, being compared to people living in this fantastic vacation resort, get, getting medication B, and those in the resort got, getting medication B were so much healthier. So you said this medication B must be fantastic. Yeah? It has nothing to do with it. So what you should do is, of course, take care that half of your patients are from the good village and bad village, and so forth. The problem is compounded by that you don't know that one village is better than the other, because you don't know about the toxicity in the air, which hasn't been discovered yet, for instance. So all this happened. Now, if you remember the doctors from the 80s and 90s, people went to him and said, he's a good doctor, he, oh, he knows me and he knows exactly what I need. This is anecdotal medicine. This doctor has been treating his patients with a product that nobody else uses, but 90% of his patients are very fine with it. Is that due to the product? Is that due to the doctor telling them that you're going to be much better now because I know what I'm doing, so they feel much better? Or is that the patient says, no, I don't feel any better. Yes, you do, says the doctor, and he writes down that they feel better because he thinks they look better or he hopes that they are better. And so, so this data is worthless. Not only is it worthless, it brings us backwards because it leads us down paths that aren't true. Which means that if we follow the methods of anecdotal medicine, we actually spend our energies in the wrong place. And we miss the real science. Which means that anecdotal medicine should not only not be wasted time on, it should be actively fought against. It detracts, right? Evidence-based medicine, that came up in the 80s. Actually, it probably came up earlier, but started being a movement and being described is based on prospective. First of all, you don't study anything after the fact. You always decide first what you're going to study and then you study it. If you do a new treatment, you start first saying, I don't look at any patients that have already been treated. I only look in future patients. Double blind means the patient should not know if he gets the treatment or not, but the doctor should not know either. So he's influence the patient to feel better and he cannot influence himself to deem it better than it is right which leads me to a little anecdote when I was doing surgery we had one of these guys doing experimental surgery on dogs that was when Adalat if anybody knows that came up and he was nifedipine and he was testing it out in dogs cardiac surgery because we did that kind of thing coronary surgery to see if it helped the outcome if it was given during surgery I don't think they do that now, but it was done then, eh? right? And um, he wrote an article about it. And we didn't much like this guy anyway. But I found his article, the preprint, on his table. And he was going to present, present this in San Francisco at the symposium. And it says, a, a, study, a double-blind study of Adalat in anesthetized dogs. Okay? Okay, that means the dog did not know if he got the product or not. This is pretty amazing. Anyway, too bad he noticed that we were standing around laughing, so he changed it before he presented it. But you can't have a double blind study in dogs. There's no way. Eh? Because one half of the blind is that the patient does not know. Of course the dog doesn't know. Eh? 